So um, uh, Promune is a, a biologics company with a difference. Uh, we actually design uh, advanced biologics that do one really important thing, is that they give you an immune response without an inflammatory response. Um, uh, the other cool thing about the technology uh, that we have is that it's simple, it's stable, it's cheap to make, and it's species agnostic. So we, we, we've gone through um, the inventors sitting up there in the third row, Sam, Dr. Sam Sanderson. Uh, he spent a, a long time figuring it out, and mice, uh, we, we've gone into pigs now, and, and we're hoping to go into humans pretty, uh, pretty soon too. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the technology has received about $7 million in grant funding thus far. Uh, this is um, including ongoing grants that we have currently. Uh, over 50 peer-reviewed uh, publications with uh, most of those studies were actually published in um, high-rated journals um, uh, with uh, mostly mice. Uh, now, we actually have uh, two proof-of-concept studies in pigs, uh, one with MRSA and one with influenza A virus, um, and we are hoping to be able to do two things. Number one is that we're hoping to actually develop veterinary use biologics first, and then piggyback on those to uh, generate enough data for um, uh, IND um, uh, applications on the human side. <laughs> the problem that we're trying to solve is simple. Um, uh, there's a lot of zoonotic diseases out there. Uh, that means um, uh, diseases with the same pathogen that jumps from one species to the other. Uh, this has uh, been talked about more recently under the kind of One Health uh, approach where uh, there's, there's a, um, a drive now to think about the um, health of the animal together with the health of the human in kind of similar fashion uh, because we do share our environment with animals, um, uh, especially our pets, and uh, they can pick some stuff up from us, we can pick stuff up from them. But that's a problem. We have a lot of diseases coming through that are jumping species all the time. And, they, they re and, and our repertoire of available drugs is actually dwindling. It's not increasing. Uh, we, all, we always need uh, more uh, better vaccines, um, uh, safer vaccines, and better adjuvants. Um, uh, there's a need for different um, uh, uh, uses for antibiotics. Currently, um, uh, antibiotics are used in uh, large concentrations in production animal facilities. Um, they're used for two things. They're used to keep infections at bay because of the high concentration of animals in one place. They're also used uh, as growth promoters. And uh, there's a, a huge regulatory push all over the world, really, um, that is going to limit the use of antibiotics for that, for that purpose. So, so we need alternatives. And obviously, there is uh, uh, the, just the, the need for alternatives to classical vaccines in cases where there is an endemic disease. <coughs> You probably will not be surprised to know that most of our vaccines that we currently use, the technology that we're using, the, the, the killed or attenuated pathogen, um, uh, I, I actually have in here as last century, but Sam pointed out that it's actually two centuries ago. Um, uh, the first vaccine actually was in the late 1890s. Uh, and we still use them today, same technology, pretty much. Um, uh, the most uh, widely used uh, adjuvant um, is alum. There are other adjuvants, of course, but that's the most widely used. Uh, the problem with alum is that it doesn't elicit the more um, preferred Th1 immune response. It gives you a Th2 immune response. And we, we really want to switch that to a Th1 response. Um, and then we are giving um, uh, large doses of antibiotics uh, uh, to, to production animals. And they, we're, we're trying to grapple with the issue of antibiotic resistance, which obviously everybody understands. So what's the technology? Technology is actually very uh, elegant in its simplicity, really. It's uh, essentially 
um, the tail end of human C5A, which is a, a complement protein. Um, Sam discovered um, uh, through his research that there's about a, um, I think it's 10 amino acid residue um, that uh, if, configure, if configured in a certain way, you can lock it in a three-dimensional structure that would actually give you that separation where it activates the immune response through the 5A receptor, but it doesn't give you the concomitant inflammatory response. And that's an extremely important aspect. It also gives you a Th1, a predominantly Th1 response, not a Th2 response, which is also a, a, a desired input. The, this, this schematic really kind of shows you the evolution of where it started. Um, it, it came to this EP54 analog, and then we're currently working with EP67, but we have um, um, a slew of other analogs that we're trying uh, to, to kind of bring into the system to actually make them work bigger, you know, kind of get a better response and, uh, uh, to a, um, uh, with, with, with better characteristics. EP67 is what we've always referred to it, but now that we're approaching um, kind of, a, we're, we're going down the path of commercialization, at least on the veterinary side, we decided to come up with a name. And the name is Host Immune Stimulatory Peptide, or HISP for short. You can blame Sam for that. Um, this again is a, just an, a, a schematic to show you the types of cells that uh, EP67 peptide can activate and the types of cells that it doesn't. Again, it's, it's a very important uh, difference uh, that uh, we keep kind of hammering on, but that, that's kind of the crux of the technology. The beauty about the technology is that you can use it in many different ways. You can use the His peptide by itself, and it will trigger an innate immune response. Or you can stick it onto a, another peptide. You can stick it onto another whole protein a whole virus, a spore, or a bacterium, whether it's encapsulated or unencapsulated, and it will give you a, um, uh, I'm sorry, go back here. It will give you a, um, uh, a, a, a essentially a vaccine. And I, like I said, you can actually use it with, with a whole host of different types of antigens. Um, we've, uh, I alluded to us using it in, in pigs in a study. This is our, our, was one of the initial studies. It's a, um, a, um, a MRSA model. Um, uh, the pathogen is uh, uh, Staph hyacus. It, um, in pigs, it causes, um, it's actually a, a problem in pigs, and it causes a lot of uh, uh, losses. Because what happens is that the pig develops these blotches, and this is obviously just because it's a, uh, this was a, a trial that was done under controlled conditions. Normally, you would see these blotches all over the body. And here you can see we had, uh, in this particular um, uh, proof of concept study, what we did is that we took two groups of pigs, and we uh, infected them with the, with the, uh, the Staph hyacus, and then we treated one group, and the other group was left untreated. And you can see the difference there between the two. This is kind of an example uh, between a, an untreated versus a treated animal right there. The, um, uh, the treatment was essentially injecting the, what I call the naked HISP peptide by itself. And the beauty about it is it essentially it was made up in water. It didn't need any other, you know, no other uh, um, uh, kind of jumping to any hoops to actually make it um, uh, in any special way. <clears throat> it was just as simple as that. Uh, we also then um, tried to see how it would work in pigs under, in a, with a different pathogen. And, in this, uh, and, and with the simplicity of, of, of to, uh, essentially how we apply the technology. Uh, what we ended up doing is choosing influenza A as another model. And in this case, what we ended up doing is uh, Sam essentially went to PubMed. We pulled out a paper that contained already recognized or defined epitopes of the influenza A virus. And what Sam went to essentially took that paper, went into the lab, and made those peptides. 
they are from either the neuraminidase or hemagglutinin proteins. And then we stuck the his peptide at the end of each epitope as an adjuvant in this case. That's it. And then we mix them together. Again, in water, or maybe it was saline, I can't remember. Um, and we stuck it in pigs um, uh, that had been infected with the influenza A virus. And, and here I'm showing some of the data, not all of it. But I'm showing you really kind of the bit where the, the vaccine that we made was, was essentially compared to the untreated group of animals. And you can see one important thing here. Th these are nasal swabs, so we're looking for infective viral particles. These are the things that when you sneeze would actually, you know, get transferred to another animal or a human being. And, 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 and what we found is with this, what I would call a proof of concept crude vaccine that essentially, I don't know how long it took some, but, but it's, uh, you know, maybe a couple of weeks to make from inception of the idea to the actually putting it in, in the pigs uh, uh, and without any optimization whatsoever. You see it did one, well, uh, an important thing is that the uh, viral part, detectable viral particles uh, compared to the control group appeared one day later and they only lasted, were only detectable one day less. What that means is that we're, we're, we're compressing the time where a person or an animal can infect others. That's a very important aspect of, of this vaccine. Um, then when we looked, uh, all the, the pigs were sacrificed and we looked at the lung lesions and you can see that the viral particles were cut in half in the heptavac, with the heptavac versus the untreated group. Now, heptavac as it stands today is not kind of ready for prime time. It still needs a lot of optimization to get it to where other commercially available vaccines are. But the difference is, is that you can make it up in water, it's stable for years at room temperature, no special requirements for adjuvants of any kind, and you get a very robust immune response. Um, we, uh, where we are right now is that we have uh, um, been in contact with the USDA Center for Veterinary Biologics. That's the kind of the arm of the, the regulatory arm that deals with vaccines uh, and immune modulators for animals. And they've agreed that we, we got the designation that this is in fact a biologic. Why is that important? Because it shaves off about two years off the regulatory requirements compared to if you needed to go through the FDA to get an approval for a drug, a veterinary drug. We've engaged a local manufacturer actually in the Lincoln area uh, who is going to help us uh, uh, get all the paperwork ready for the manufacturing process. Um, uh, and um, uh, we uh, are continually using our existing funds to push uh, the uh, uh, de development work ahead so that we can actually, um, uh, and Dr. Sam Sanderson actually received just um, t two new R01 uh, grants and one SBIR contract for Promune, and we're channeling all of that money towards completing the work um, uh, that he started on the human side and ha hopefully getting to where we can do an IND and hopefully um, uh, using some of the pig data as uh, preclinical data for, for, that, for those applications. Um, we're, um, uh, we, we have a strategic partnership with a company that is um, uh, where we do all of our testing with them essentially on, uh, on the large animals. We are preparing the data for uh, the IND filings with the uh, FDA for a first in human um, trial on the, um, uh, we're probably gonna do the HISP peptide for the human, in this case it would be HISP-H. Uh, and then uh, we're in the, in the process of continuing to um, look for uh, venture funding as well as looking for strategic partnerships as we go along. And that's it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Um, so you ca so that's a very good question, actually. So yes, you can co-inject it. Is essentially it's it's in there with the vaccine. You can co-inject it without having to covalent, covalently attach it. That's one way of using it. It's extremely versatile. Um, so it's been essentially injected by itself, co-injected by just simple mixing, as well as covalently attached to peptide, path whole pathogen, whole protein. Yeah. We think that you get a better, we think that we, so when you, have, when you have the peptide by itself, remember when I showed that schematic earlier, it's actually in the mechanism of action. Uh, because we were looking for a, um, a more uh, adaptive immune response rather than an innate immune response, when you're mixing the peptide with the antigen, it's, it kind of elicits more of an innate response rather than an adaptive response. So uh, by attaching it, we get that Th1 response, which we wouldn't get normally if we're attaching it to, uh, if we're just mixing it with the product. 